Shalom everybody and welcome back to Insights in the Parsha of the Week, Parshat Shoftim. So as you can see, this Parsha is packed with so many, many laws. Uh, one that we'd like to focus on tonight is the laws of the Are Miklat, the cities of refuge, which the Torah has mentioned a few times already at the end of Bamidbar, okay, and there's other places, and this week's Parsha. So the laws of Ari Miklat basically is that someone who killed unintentionally, unintentionally, so he is entitled to flee to the city. And why do you have to flee? Because the family members of the person who was killed accidentally might be burning for revenge. They might not accept that he killed accidentally, according to the, the ruling of the Beit Din. So he's allowed to hide in these cities, these villages, a refuge, and they're not allowed to hurt him at all, okay? So the Torah, this week's parsha, goes into delineate the exact location where you should put the cities of refuge, and how every crossroads, every every intersection has to have an arrow pointing to the army clad. Why? So that a person who's running to get to the army clad, he shouldn't have an excuse and a reason why he didn't get there on time. There will be every interchange, you know, on the roads. It says miklat arrow this way, that way, and then the Torah goes into details of where to be positioned. To third, the whole country from top to bottom. And at every third, you put one of these villages of refuge. Okay? And Rashi's quoting, Rashi's bringing down also, and we know already that in already the eastern side of the Jordan River, before the Jews entered, and the Jews already conquered the land of Sichon and Og, and in a wake attached it to the Holy Land. That's where Reuven and, and Gad and half of Menashe took their land. So Moshe Rabbeinu, he's the one who already picked and chose the three cities of Ari Miklat that should be there. So he said, Moshe Rabbeinu, a mitzvah that comes to my hand and I can do it, I'll do it. Because if he's already allowed there, he's not allowed to pass into the Holy Land itself. So he said, if it's a mitzvah that applies to this land because of the tribe of Reuven and, and God and Hafa Menashe, so I'll do it. And Moshe Rabbeinu set aside the three are miklat in on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Yehoshua is the one who, after they did the kibush, they conquered the land of Israel. So in his time and afterwards, they set aside these three for the Holy Land. So now the Torah says about the future. Look what it says here. Chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Sorry, so 8 and 9. Sorry, verses 8 and 9 and chapter 19. He says, And if Hashem will expand, Hashem your Lord will expand your borders, like He swore to your ancestors, your forefathers, and Hashem will give to you the whole land, in which He spoke that He would give to your forefathers. So, verse 9, If you guard, safeguard this the, this whole mitzvah to do it, Lasota, Asher Nochim Mitzvah Yom, in which I'm commanding you to today, which is what? Le'ahavat Hashem Elokecha, to love Hashem your Lord, Ve'lalechet Bidrachav Kol Ayamim, and to go in His ways of Hashem all your days. So the reward for that will be, Ve'asafta Lecha Od Shalosh Arim, you will add another three cities of refuge, Al Hashalosh Ha'ele. On these three, which you should add in the Holy Land itself. Because the order is the three that were done by Moshe Rabbeinu in the land of Sichon and Og. And then the three in the Holy Land itself. And then the three additional ones. So look, let's take a look at Rashi. Ve'im yachiv, in verse 8. And if Hashem will expand. So Rashi reads, don't translate and if. Rather read it. Ka'asher. Sorry. Ka'asher nishba latet lecha eretz keni uknizi v'kadmonim. And if, really is when Hashem will give you an expansion of the land, like Hashem already swore to give to you the land of Keni, Knizi, and Kadmoni, who referred to, by the way, as Ammon, Moab, and Edom. The lands of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, which seem to be close by the Holy Land, will be added to the Holy Land. So when Hashem adds more land in the future, the Zul Mashiach comes, okay? Verse number 9, Rashi, od shalosh, and you should add another three. Rashi says, So in total we have nine cities of refuge. 
Shalosha Be'ever Yarden, like we said, the three on the east side of the Jordan River, which is what Moshe Rabbeinu is the one who established them. V'shalosh Be'eretz Canaan, the three in the land itself of, of the Holy Land of Canaan, which Yeshua and the Beidinim after him did. V'shalosh Latid Lavo, and three for future. Okay? So in total we have here nine cities of refuge, six present-day Israel, which we don't have right now, because we don't have a Beit Din, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. But when the temple was standing, and the Jews had conquered the land, and were settled properly, so that the three that Moshe Rabbeinu established in the land of Sichon and Og, which today is like Jordan, where Jordan is today, and the three in Eretz Yisrael, and when Mashiach comes, another three. So there's a few questions here. Question number one, we're always taught that, you know, in the future... There'll be the the lamb will live with the with the zev with the wolf. Loisa goy el goy cherev veloy medu od milchama. One nation will not raise a sword against another. There'll be no more war. So all the more so by the Jewish people, there won't be war. So why the need to make three more cities of refuge, which happens when people are killed unintentionally, and the family members want to, the goel hadam, those who want to redeem the the spilt blood, want to take revenge. You would think. In future, there's not going to be that attitude anymore. It's going to be love and peace and happiness. So why is the Torah telling us, you know, of the importance of making another three cities? And and also the Torah stresses this Aremi Klat. In important parts of the Torah, all of a sudden they throw in, they juxtapose to very important parts of the Torah, like you, I think you can see by the Ten, tab, the ten Commandments in Vayit Hanan, that also there is brought down the, the Aremi Klat. You begin to wonder, why such a big deal? Why does the Torah like emphasize a lot these are Miklat, to the extent that even Moshe Rabbeinu was so burning to do it, to already set aside these cities of refuge in his lifetime. It's like his priority. It was Moshe Rabbeinu's priority to get the, the Aram Miklat set. What, what's going on? What, what's so, so drastic and so severe? And again, the question that we asked, why in the future are you going to add another three? Nine cities of refuge because of killers by accident? There's still going to be such a thing. We, we, we get the impression when Mashiach comes, everything will be beautiful and peaceful and harmony and there will be high perceptions of godliness by everyone. No one's going to do stupid things of killing someone unintentional. So what's going on? What is this? What, how, how, is, how can it be? What's going on here? <clears throat> so it seems that the idea of a shogeg, because these cities were reserved for Jews who killed unintentional. What is a shogeg? A shogeg is someone whose intent is pure and holy and good, but the action was wrong. He had a good intention, like the Torah brings it this week's the Parsha. The guy was cutting wood, chopping wood in the forest. Rashi brings this down. It's also the Psukim, okay? And, uh, and by accident, the axe slipped the actual wood in Kata, it's called, and it hit and killed the guy who was standing next to the guy while he was cutting the wood. Or another example Rashi brings down from a different opinion, that the guy was cutting the wood and a sliver of the wood that he cut went in and killed the person. It, like it went into his neck, stabbed him, and he couldn't breathe and he died, for example. So here the person had no bad intention at all. And yet the act was done wrong. What's the idea of Shogeg? <coughs> the idea of Shogeg, a person who's unintentional, is something which is far-reaching. A person who's unintentional is considered innocent. He's not considered guilty. That's why he's allowed to live. That's why he has these, these cities of ref, refuge, refuge to run to. But because the action was blemished, still he needs to he needs to pay the price. What's the idea on a deeper level of Shogeg? Shogeg is also a person who's running to do good, okay? But because he's too, too much in the light of doing good, so Hashem purposely makes him stumble in doing an unintentional action of evil, of bad. In this case, killing, which is an extreme example. How could, so w why is that set up? Why is it set up like that? So Nachman explains in Lesson 24, Likuti Moran, that this is the, the way for a person to perceive light, the infinite light, which is clarity in life. And it's the, it's the Sheifa, it's every Jew, his goal is to come to this light. Every Jew in his inner essence yearns to reconnect to this light because the whole purpose of the universe Rav Nossin explains is that the infinite light shine into the world Hashem created this finite existence of the universe so that mankind with good deeds with looking for God 
can be come to reveal his light. Like the Zohar says, begin the Yishtemoda in Led. Hashem created the world for the purpose of that he should be made known in the world. Hashem being made known in the world is basically his infinite light shining into the world. Two opposites, a finite existence, yet containing with it access and awareness of Hashem's infinite light. Two opposites, okay? So a Jew running forward, Rabbi Nachman explains there in Lesson 24, the way to perceive this light is he has to be bounced back. He has to experience what's called the betisha in the language of the Zohar, where he gets smashed, he gets smacked and bounced back, okay? The case of a, a person who's shogeg is very similar. His intent is honesty, doing good. He doesn't plan to kill anybody. He's not trying to hurt anyone. He's trying to do the will of Hashem. <clears throat> and yet Hashem makes a person stumble in bad actions, even though it's unintentional. But there's a bad action. Why? So it, it's similar to this scenario where a person is running forward to the light. And yet, like Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 24, the person is pushed back. Why is he pushed back? Because if he continues to go forward, the person will disintegrate in the light. The light is too intense, so he will disintegrate. So what's needed is a type of a barrier to push the person back. So too in the shogeg, a person is good, sometimes even too good, and he's going too fast, too much forward. This is brought down in this farm, by the way. And then from Shemaim, they make a person stumble and fall in a shogeg, an unintentional act of wrongdoing he didn't want to do it so then why did hashem allow this to happen for that person because it's a like a breaker sign the person is doing good yes bravo but he's going too fast too ahead the only way to stop him in this case is let him fall and stumble in an unintentional sin what did he do wrong he didn't do necessarily anything wrong but he's going too fast He's going too far of his goodness, his good-heartedness. So from Shemayim, they push him to a shogeg scenario, okay? So with this in mind, this also will exist in the future. Because in the future, there will be a big level of awareness of Hashem in the world. right? <speaking in Hebrew> that in the future time, the world will be filled with such knowledge of Hashem, like the sea. The, the sea where you, on, the, on the sea shore, sea level you just see a flat sea but under the sea level it's like there's levels there's gradations and levels of how deep it goes okay so to the real levels of perception of god of awareness which will be so high compared to now <coughs> because of that there will be exist shogeg scenarios where people are running to be good to be sometimes too good and they can't handle the light. They don't have vessels for this infinite light. So what's needed is to push them back. Sometimes they don't do it on their own. So Hashem forces an unintentional sin. He lets them stumble. They have good intent, but they do something wrong. Why Hashem? Why? Because you have to take breaks. You have to put the brakes on. You have to take it easy. Okay? Because that's the only way, Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 24, that you can perceive the infinite light. Is that you take the brakes. You take the bounce back. And while being bounced back, that's how you perceive. In the setback, that's how you perceive, okay? So with this in mind, we can understand why in the future, three more cities of refuge will be added. The original three from Moshe, the three from Yehoshua and the land of Israel, and the three for Keni, Knizi, Kadmoni, land of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, Okay? So th th these nine will be added to, to the future scenario. Now the question still remains, why number nine? Why nine? Why not 15? Why not 25? Why not 40? Why number nine? The number nine, Rabbi Nachman says, refers to the idea of nine chambers. There are nine hechalot, chambers, that are created when a person bounces back. These three are due to the three sections of the mind, which are called Chochma Bina Da'at, the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, when being bounced back, they become intertwingled, intertwined, and they become multiplied. So three times three is nine. But more than that, Rabbi Nachman says that in order, Bezat Hashem, to come to these nine chambers, to come to try to pursue the, the, the infinite night, infinite light, sorry, a Jew must do mitzvot with joy. 
when a Jew does mitzvot with joy, the energy of the mitzvah, which is the energy of holiness, the energy of the divine presence itself, which is stuck in the exile, is extracted by the person who does a mitzvah b'simcha. So in that process, Rabbi Nachman mentions there's three stages. There's the stages of the legs, which are called uh, malchut, netzach, hod, yesod. That's really four, sorry. Malchut is the actual holiness that's trapped. When a Jew does a mitzvah with joy, he extracts the, 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 the level of malchut, which refers to the shechina, like we mentioned, out of the exile, and goes to the level of the legs, which are netzach, hod, yesod, that three, that trip, that, 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 that tri-group. Then it goes up to the level of the hands, which is called Chesed Gvur Tiferet, and then to the level of Chochma Bin So it's three plus three plus three is nine. He says, just to explain, that when a person does a mitzvah b'simcha and extracts it from the evil, so that the mitzvah gains momentum, like walking with the legs. Momentum is normally associated with a person's legs, so to spiritually the mitzvah, the mitzvah now has momentum with its legs, and it goes to arouse the whole world back to Hashem. And then when that is done, bracha is activated due to the mitzvah, which corresponds to the hands. That's why the Kohanim, they bless Aaron, and the Kohanim, they bless with the hands. And then finally, what that benefits is that the blessing of intellect is bestowed upon people. And that's Chochmah Bin Adat, the last triad, the last group of three. So we have three, plus three, plus three is nine. So these nine are miklat, take a look. The first three in the diaspora were initiated by Moshe Rabbeinu himself. These three are in Miklat, cities of refuge, which were, again, for Jews who are unintentional, shogeg, good intent, but bad deed, okay? So this was done in the diaspora, lands which were taken from Sichon and Og and became sanctified to a certain degree to the Holy Land. This was done by Moshe Rabbeinu because only a tzaddik of that caliber who, who's, who can do mitzvot, with such joy at the level of Moshe Rabbeinu, we know Moshe Rabbeinu was happy because we say every Shabbat morning, Yismach Moshe b'matenat chelko. Rejoice Moshe in the portion, uh, in, your, in, your, in the, the gift of your portion. So Moshe Rabbeinu is someone, believe it or not, who represents Simcha, and he's the, he's the pinnacle of doing mitzvot b'simcha. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. So he's the initial extractor of the mitzvot. So he was designated, he was allowed to already set aside the three cities of refuge for unintentional Jews, for Shogeg Yidin, and it was specifically in an impure land, the land of the diaspora, which again became to a degree sanctified, the land of Jordan today. He's the one who sanctified the first triad. Next, Yoshua bin Nun, the, 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 the main disciple of Moshe Rabbeinu, who was allowed to enter the Holy Land, and the land of Israel being the source of blessing for the entire world. So he, Yoshua bin Nun, being a faithful disciple and receiving from Moshe Rabbeinu, which is the idea of hands also. Yoshua had hands to receive from his teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu. So he was given the merit to set aside the three cities in, the, in Eretz Israel, him and his disciples. So those are the three cities of refuge which were set aside in the land itself by Yoshua bin Nun. And finally, the, the, the last three, which correspond to the mind, the actual blessing of intellect, Chochmah bin Adat, which will be fully revealed when Mashiach comes. So Mashiach will be the one, Bezot Hashem, to establish and institute the three final cities of refuge in the land of Keni, Knizi, and Kadmoni, which again is Amon, Moab, and Edom, Bezot Hashem. And that's the last three that we're waiting for. So nine totaling, the three levels, the three, chains, three stages, and by three specific tzaddikim, who are the masters, each one, of that domain. Moshe Rabbeinu, of the Simcha, doing the mitzvot. Yoshua Rabbeinun, being the disciple to receive the blessings due to Moshe Rabbeinu. And Mashiach, who will fight with the Torah received from Moshe Rabbeinu, and will be the master. Moshe, Mashiach, in a sense, is a, is, a, is, a rep, is a reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's why Moshe stands for Moshe Hayahu, Hu Sheyeyeh, Right? That which was is what will be. That's Mem Shin Hei, and also Moshe's Gematria Shilo, which is that which is referring to Mashiach Bezat Hashem. So with these nine, we can understand why the city refuges were set aside or are going to be and were set by these three tzaddikim, and why the idea of Shogeg is so important. What comes out of this on a practical level is that if you always express your good desire to Hashem, so so 
even if, God forbid, you do fall to blemishes and doing wrong things, even to the extent of killing someone, if now you always bombard Hashem with good desires, and you tell Hashem, I'm trying to be good, I want to be good, I don't want to be bad, I don't want to do bad, so you are in the category of shogeg and not mezid. Not like your death penalty, and that's it, it's finished, it's final. You always have hope when you're shogeg. This is why the Ir Miklat is such a big deal, because it comes to show the level of hope for someone who's unintentional, even in an extreme example as murder and death, God forbid. Shabbat Shalom, and be well.